Welcome once again for our first Friday of the month and in a while we will be having our uh, breaking of bread so I'll prepare the elements with you because after the preaching we will proceed right away to the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper. So now as uh, we continue to study in the book of Matthew a very important study in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We all remember that when Jesus Christ was here on earth not only to 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 save us but the most of is how to live in full reliance and confidence in the guidance and power of the holy spirit especially through the word of god that's why in john 17 17 the lord prays he prayed for all of us and said sanctify them by your truth because your word is true so now may i ask all of you to open our your bible in Matthew chapter 9, okay, and our main text can be found on verse 13, okay, and I will read, and all of us together in, in every translation you have there, let us all read the word of God together. But let's start with this key verse, it's Matthew 9, 13, sorry, don't mind that 13, huh? okay but go and learn what this means i desire compassion and not sacrifice for i did not come to call the righteous but sinners so let's start with verse 9 it's all all started here as jesus went on from there okay remember the last time they, they were there in the upper room in the in the room in the house of uh, peter in capernaum he saw a man called matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. Verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12, but when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And lastly, verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now in our text from verses 9, actually, it's all the way to verse 17, but we will make it two parts, 9 to 13, and then next week, 14 to 17. Of course, we believe in the context of this, uh, in the flow, they are two parts, okay? From 9 to 17 of Matthew, there is one of the most conclusive, okay? It's very uh, a discerning, intense, comprehensive statement. Of our Lord no, that the Lord has ever made it gives us a a full view or or, or full perspective about his ministry so I would like to invite everyone encourage everyone to after this sermon always go back to the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal all the more for I believe not only in this sermon during our Friday service that we can read the Word of God, it is always available. So when you got when you go back to your own um, bed or where, where you can uh, be alone with God, go back to this Word. And I guarantee you, my brothers, the Lord will reveal all the more. When I was reading this very passage, it is very, very familiar with all of us. But let us look on the on a on a level in the vantage point of the author and as well in the vantage point most of all of the lord jesus christ why in this sequence of events he's able to to express or to demonstrate his power but still the response of the people are in negative and very few very few who are responding in positive and those who who is responding in positive are mostly the sinners but the righteous person 
whom they consider themselves a righteous, they always respond in a negative way. So it is one of the most important statements ever recorded in the Bible in verse 13. Okay, at the end of verse 13, the Lord said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Why did Jesus come into the world? Apart from what we what we know before clearly he says it here in this very verse to call sinners he's calling sinners those who know they have a a uh, a desperate situation about their sins those who are hurting those who are hungry those who are thirsty those who are weak and those who those who are weary those who are broken and those whose, whose life they already exhausted everything and those what we call and the lord said here sinners sinners who know they are sinners but the problem is there are also the other audience or the other uh, crowd part of the crowd where they are considering themselves they are already righteous before god that's why in this very powerful presentation of jesus christ's lordship in matthew 8 and matthew 9 it's all about the the demonstration of his power it's all about him that's why we we, we wanted everyone to see in that vantage point not only in the in, in our condition when we are lonesome with something not related to your calling it's all about him it's all about the power of the lord jesus christ demonstrated here effectively by matthew that's why the sequence of miracles are is ascending they are ascending okay so let let us once again focus on what really the intention of matthew why he he had written down this uh very wonderful event actually you will discover that it's all about him in verse 13 uh, 9 to 13 we will see who Matthew, the, the writer or the author of this very book. Okay? <clears throat> so one of the famous, many famous um, Christians, leaders, for example, Augustine. Everyone uh, is seeing Augustine as a very uh, straightforward man. But in fact, if you watch the movie, uh, Augustine, the son of her tears, you will discover that also Augustine have some difficulties, especially during his uh, uh, younger days. Now let us look on, on the word of Augustine and we and uh, how he could he considered himself. He said, Augustine said, "Lord, save me from that wicked man." When who is that wicked man? Myself. Look at this uh, humility of this great man of God. And one, one also uh, a very famous or perhaps uh, the greatest preacher might be Scotland ever had, John Knox. No? You know John Knox very well. He said here, in youth, in middle age, and now, after many battles, I find nothing in me but corruption. Hallelujah. These are great preachers, great men of God, and yet... They were moved with the compassion, okay? The title of our sermon, with the compassion that God has given unto them. And even though they are a great preacher, a great man of God during their time, still, they can find a way in regards to their wickedness. And even John Wesley. John Wesley said, I am falling short of the glory of God. My whole heart is altogether corrupt and abominable. And consequently, my whole life, seeing an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Wow. You know, if you are in the presence of God, it will, it, you, it will bring you to your knees and humility. And even Prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, he was so devastated during that time because of the death of, of the king. I forgot the name of the king but he was so devastated during that time and what he what he did because he guided that king 
and that king uh, died as a leper. And he looked up. When he looked up, he saw the holiness of God. And he saw even in his vision, the most holy created being, the angel or the cherubim, they covered their pieces. Why? They cannot contain God's holiness. They are the most holiest being. And also the prophet Isaiah, he's the most righteous prophet during his time. But he said, woe to me. And that is a curse word. If you look that in the, in the Hebrew word, it is a curse word. Woe to me, a man of unclean lips. Now these three persons, Augustine, John Knox, John Wesley, Prophet Isaiah, Matthew, here is presenting the Lord Christ, his Lordship. And he's trying to, to prove it in every possible way. And let us remember in chapter 8 and chapter 9, he verifies the Lordship of Christ, of the Lord Jesus, the Saviorhood of Christ, his deity, the reality that he is the Son of God, the Messiah. He tries to verify it here as well by the miracles that Jesus did. And again, they are not random miracles. They are not. They are carefully selected to show the kind of Messiah's credential and how they fulfill all the Old Testament expectation. That's why it is very important to look on the context, on the rightful uh, intention and motives of the author. So I encourage everyone, when you read your, the Word of God, when you read the Bible, study as if you are there in that context. And as well, what it will be the spiritual application in our contemporaries. Because there are responses here. There are nine miracles from chapter 8 to chapter 9. Three sets of three. And after each set of three, there is always a response given. The first three miracles, it dealt about diseases or disease, sickness. And it showed Christ's power over those illness. And again, the power of Christ over the body and its decay. And after those miracles, let us all remember and let us all be reminded that there was a response. Remember, there are people who approached Jesus Christ. The would-be disciples came and they were half-hearted shallow superficial and they said we want to follow you but when they heard the cost when they heard the price they went away and so the response on that miracles were so sad jesus christ was so sad because their priorities is the is um doing what they think best for them then then there was the, the second three sets of miracles. And here in that miracle, not so much to emphasize illness, but rather the first of the second three was his power over the elements of nature, the wind and the sea. Not only God can calm the storms of your life. That is not the intention of Matthew here. He's showing to us the Lordship, the power of the Lord over natural elements. His power over the elements of nature, the wind and the sea. And the second is power over demons. And the third is power over sin. And we saw that last week. It's all about the demonstration of his power. That's why we look to Jesus. He's not only authored our faith, but there is a power working within us. Now comes here in this very part. That's where in, in this chapter 9, Jesus started forgiving a man's sin. Remember the, 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 the paralytic? He, he, he had forgiven man's sin totally and completely. And Matthew is saying that Jesus Christ, our Messiah, 
has power over the physical body. He has power over the natural elements. He has power over the demonic, demonic host. And he has power over sin. And therefore, Jesus Christ is showing that he is fit to bring us the kingdom. Those are previews. Those are showcase. He's making a showcase, a, a wonder demonstration of what kingdom of God is all about. And he has given a miracle where Jesus, in the last uh, week that we have discussed, he forgave a man's sin. And this is the continu continuation. And then we saw the response. Three miracles and then a response. And the response is divided. There is a positive response and there is a negative response. The positive re response comes from the sinner. And the negative response comes from the one who thinks they are righteous. But the response here in verse 9 to 17, it is the response of Matthew, a positive response. The call of Matthew. Jesus Christ, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. He said unto him, follow me. And Matthew, he just arose and followed. That's a positive response. And I pray that tonight we will have a positive response. We are having, we are having this series for many months now and i pray that we elevate our worship and service to our living god because sometimes we limit ourselves do not allow the enemy to do that do not allow even yourself to to tell to tell to yourself that you cannot do it god can do everything there's nothing impossible. That's why it is very important in this very chapter wherein Matthew will talk about himself in pure humility. He had written this book, Gospel, and now it is about him, about his call, about his response when he is hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let us go back once again. <clears throat> On that very verse, in verse 13, the Lord said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now from verse 1 to verse 8, Jesus has been teaching. And in probably, remember in Peter's house in Capernaum, by the seashore, the meeting was already over. The paralytic man is healed. He's gone with his poor friend. Remember, he was brought by poor friend. And Jesus goes out. Okay? The meeting is dismissed. This is the scenario, huh? But typically, uh, it always Jesus leaves. And and during the time, and as well in, in, in the other writers, in the, in the other account, uh, in Mark chapter 2, you will find this. And Luke chapter 5, it is well described it for us. Because in the in, in the in the in the book in this and in this book in the book of Matthew, there it is very little information that Matthew has given. So so once again, Jesus Christ walked along the shore in the in the northern edge or in the northern part of the Lake of Galilee, and following him were his disciples, the one at least that has been called already, and behind. Also, the great multitudes of crowds were following him. And they, were, they never left Jesus Christ. They were so astonished at what he, he is doing. They were so fascinated. They were amazed. The meeting, have made, the meeting in, in, the, in the upper room may have been over in the house, but they as well followed him wherever he, he go. And while Jesus walking, he's walking along the shore with this mass of people around him. And that point... We come to uh, verse 9, and as Jesus passed forth from there, that is from the house, okay, of might be Peter, and walking along the shore, he saw a man named Matthew. And by the way, in the other gospel, 
he called him, I, uh, Luke called him Levi in, in the book of Luke. Let us look on the compassionate heart of the Lord Jesus Christ here. And let us once again ask the Holy Spirit to unlock the message of this passage. Three important things or points that we can learn from the compassionate heart of the Lord, especially in this very uh, uh, occasion, the result or the consequences when he is moved by his compassion, his desire for mercy. Okay? That, I will just go back to my previous slide. That word, that statement that Jesus Christ had mentioned, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners, is actually he quoted uh a verse from uh, Hosea 6.6. 6. And I will discuss, discuss that in the third point. He said, uh, God said here, I desire mercy and not a sacrifice. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ has quoted here. So we will focus on that compassionate um, heart of the Lord, the result or the consequences when he is moved by his compassion. So th there are three things that we wanted to see. Jesus' compassion brings about conversion. Number two, Jesus' compassion, it brings about conviction. And third, Jesus' compassion, it brings about celebration. Okay? Again, he saw a man named Matthew. The same way Jesus Christ had seen us. In the other gospel, Matthew's name is Levi because in the in the Jewish context in the Jewish tradition it is not uncommon for a man to have two names Thomas was called Didymus and Bartholomew I, uh, he was called also Nathaniel Simon Peter okay and here Matthew the, the 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 meaning of his name actually is give up jehovah and we re, and we don't know really uh but again it is not uncommon to have two names because if you will read mark 2 and look 5 you might be confused who is levi who is uh matthew they're the same okay so again jesus christ he sees him where sitting at the tax office and said unto him follow me and he rose and followed the lord jesus christ now if you don't know anything about matthew and from this message we are going to learn this afternoon that matthew was actually he, he was a modest man he was truly humble and he reduces his whole conversation to one verse and he says absolutely nothing about himself. But he has something very strong in his mind. Now, the first part of the text, it shows us Jesus receiving the sinner. And the question comes, he healed the paralytic and again he forgave all his sins. But the question is, how far does this forgiveness go? What kind of people? Can Jesus really forgive? And so Matthew, Matthew says here, in effect, in verse 9, he is saying, He forgave me. And what is the importance of that? Saying that in, in effect, that Matthew is saying to all of us, He forgave me. After that paralytic encounter where Jesus Christ forgave that man and cure his uh, sickness. Matthew, in fact, is showing us also Jesus Christ forgave me. And what is the importance of that in this text? It is very, very small. It is very important. He's the writer. And, and, and you know, if you study the life of Matthew, you will find out and you will be surprised that Matthew in, in Capernaum, in his town, he was the most hateful person in Capernaum. Not because he is Matthew. Not because he is Levi. Matthew was the most wretched sinner in town. 
That's why he uses himself as an illustration. And how, again, far does this forgiveness go? Jesus Christ's forgiveness, how far it will go? And here Matthew, he calls himself like what Paul tried to, to take on his title, the chip of sinners. Yes. Now, let us look. A man named Matthew. But we have to we have to know about him. And in this um, particular account in the book of Matthew, he tells little about him. He tells little about this country. But in the other, in Mark chapter 2 and Luke chapter 5, it talks about him. Again, let's start with a very wonderful story of Matthew. How Jesus Christ found him. He was sitting there at a tax office. Okay? Again, Matthew, one of the hated or perhaps the most wretched men in Capernaum. Why? Because it's all about his job. Okay? Let us talk about, number one, the conversion of Matthew. The consequences when Jesus Christ's compassion moves, it brings about conversion. Matthew, a classic illustration of a man wherein God in in his power to forgive sin. Matthew was a publican, or publicani in Greek. They were, and what is publican? They were a type of people who served Rome. Okay? Now, when Rome moved, when, when Rome moved in and took over Palestine during the time, they wanted to exact taxes. And any individuals living in the land of Palestine can buy permits or franchise from the Roman government which gave them the right to operate the taxation system in certain district or certain town. And Matthew, okay, bought into the Roman system. He, re he, he rebuilt himself here. That's why he was so hated as a traitor to the cause of Israel. Why? Because in the mind of the Jew, it's a terrible thing. Okay? Doing taxation, it is anti-nationalistic to them. It is anti-Jewish. So Matthew, literally, he bought his way into the Roman system. He bought a franchise. He bought a permit for taxation from Rome. And then Rome, then... Uh, required that he collect a certain amount of taxes and anything he could get over that he could keep meaning he can put surcharge or he can put interest in the roman government okay in order to keep him happy and and on their side would support him in excesses and his abuse this is the work of matthew he overcharged. He extorted people. And he had the Romans behind him. So there was a, a gross oppression and abuse on the side of Matthew here. He had to pay Rome a certain amount and everything else he could get was his own. A tax collector. He took bribes from the rich. They extorted from the middle class. And as well to the poor. And they and with that they became a hated person in the in Israel, not only in, in Capernaum, but in this particular town. They despise him. Because for the Jew, it is anti-nationalistic, it's anti-Jewish. That's what they're doing. They are, they are collecting or they are amassing fortune at the expense of their own oppressed countrymen. And, and take note, and most of the Jew, okay, they believe that it was wrong to pay taxes. They, they, they felt, they know that only God should receive their money. In the Jewish thinking, they were looking backward to an Old Testament theocracy. That's why the question that the Pharisees asked our Lord one time, and, it, and, and, and when they tried to, to, to catch the Lord in regards to this, when they took a coin and said, 
who is this? Remember, they, they have given and they have shown him a coin. And Jesus Christ said, well, it got Caesar picture on it. So whatever is Caesar, give it to Caesar. Whatever pertains to God, give it to God. So in the Jewish thinking, the, the work or the job of Matthew here, being a tax collector, his, his sin is beyond repentance. Yes, that's what they think. And by the way, in, in the Jewish context, there are two categories of tax collector. Okay? So, number one, there is in Hebrew, gabai, meaning the general tax collector. Again, these people were appointed by the Roman uh, government because they have find a way to buy franchise permits to do taxation. In return, they are, they are doing it with abuse. Okay, here's the first type of general tax collector in Hebrew. In, in our time, okay, they, they are the tax collector who, who are collecting um, the ordinary taxes, the basic or the regular taxes. And what they will do, this gabai, they will just add interest or surcharges onto that to make their own fortune. For example, it is only the tax for the Roman is 10, they will add 5, like that. It, it depends. It's, it has no limit. And there was another kind of tax collector. We, we call them the mokes or the, or the duty tax collector or the tariff tax collector. Their job is to collect duty on everything else. Okay? The general tax being collected by the gabay, while the duty or the tariff or those things that you can put taxes, okay? There were these duties were given to a different type of men or type type, type of collector, which are, which is which are the mokes, and they are the one who collect tax on all on, on import, export, everything bought, everything sold, everything in that road, in every bridge, harbor, every town, everything. They can put taxes. Remember. This is in Galilee, and, and, and people were, were, were coming from, from different places. So both of them, they were both despised by the people of Israel. The Gabai, they were despised. The Moges, they, they were more despised. Because even in the smaller thing, they are putting taxes. That's why Matthew, okay, He's sitting there in the in the area in the northern part or northern part or the north port of the Sea of Galilee, and probably he was collecting taxes on all that which is going on on the lake. Okay, in the industry of fishing and whatever else he can collect, he would have been in in that very uh, strategic position, also because if you will look at the map. There, there's a road going to Damascus there, to the west. So probably he talks everybody going by east and west. So Matthew is a wealthy man. He's a wealthy Jewish tax collector who, who, who get his franchise from the Roman taxation system. Okay? Matthew, among these two types, of tax collector can be identified in the mokes because in the mokes the duty tax collector there are two categories number one is the grand mokes they are the one um, funding okay the, the 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 biggest operation and Matthew is the little one or the little mokes of Capernaum but that little one, because he's charging everything they are charging almost everything he is the worst man in the city he is the most wretched man. As far as the people were concerned, he was the most wretched human being in their town. They hated him. They paid him for, for the reason they, they are not, because they are not afraid, no, but because they are, are commanded by the government of Rome. And for them, there is a saying, very strong saying from Rabbi, in the, in the Rabbi, from, from the Rabbi. They said, 
or a little mockers like Matthew. Repentance is well impossible. That's how they look, Matthew. His sins is beyond forgiveness. If there's one sinner who could never be forgiven, according to the Jew, it will be the little mockers. And that's it, Matthew. That is his situation here, my brothers and my sisters. That's why he just mentioned very little about him. When they said, the Lord, follow me, he just got up and followed him. He did not tell, but look and mark they have some details details about this and if you if you will study in uh, extra biblical study about matthew you will find out that this is his job and no and nobody is happy about him okay and here this simple man sitting at his table doing his thing and jesus said follow me and he did Matthew was the worst now he got better because he's following the Lord and I believe that Matthew was a man also under conviction and we be and we, we and we believe in in chapter 9 this is a wonderful conversion and as well conviction of this wretched man in the town Matthew was the worst but he got better so here in this uh, <clears throat> in this encounter how did Matthew responded just like that remember Jesus had ministered and he had ministered and ministered all over the area they know who Jesus Christ is they know everything about his teaching they know everything he did they know his wonders they know those miracles that jesus christ were doing during the time they know all the signs they heard what he said they know also that he comes for the forgiveness of sin they knew exactly what they were getting into and they were ready their hearts were prepared and that heart is the heart of matthew the Bible said faith comes from in hearing and hearing the word of God. That's why we always encourage everyone, especially those who are uh, doing the Great Commission, that every time we share the word of God, there's someone listening. Despite of their wretched condition, there will be someone who will be convicted of the word of God. And Matthew was a man under conviction. He was moved by Jesus' compassion, and it brings about conviction. He is hearing about what the Lord is teaching. He is hearing about what the Lord is doing. And his, in his heart, he wanted forgiveness. But the system he was into, he could never have it, that forgiveness. And the people, they're telling, telling him that his sins are cannot be, con, cannot be forgiven. So, that encounter in the upper room of peter he was not there what was there was a seeking person just like the paralytic but he is hearing what jesus christ has done he was down there okay getting his money because that's all he was committed to do and matthew recognized his sin and I believe, my brothers and my sister, if we are in this situation, we know that there's something wrong in our heart. We know that, that we need something from our, our Lord. And that is a recognition of sin, just like my Matthew. And I believe that is the reason he got up so fast and followed. He's just waiting. There's not even... Uh, a, a big discussion about it when Jesus Christ said follow me and even in in the account of the uh, Dr. Luke Luke said he, he had a little statement here and he said and Levi got up and he left everything and followed him he forsook all but why Matthew he did not put the statement like what Luke 
That's why I believe he was just trapped in, in, in this system, but his heart be convicted now because of the compassion that Jesus Christ is bringing unto them through his teaching, through his miracles, and those demonstrations of his power, and mature listening on that. And he understood that he has hope that in, this, in the system that he has, a very simple system, if, if we are also stuck up in a simple condition, my brothers and my sisters, right now, just like Matthew, there is now a move of Jesus Christ's compassion that will bring you into conversion and conviction. And the Lord is telling to you right now, follow me. Here, Matthew, in his humility, he did not write it down there where in fact he is the writer. Many of the writers in our time, they will put everything that will describe their righteousness. But in Matthew's humility, he just put a very little word. He got up and followed. But here in Luke's account, he left everything. What a showcase of, of what a poor in the spirit heart. A beatitude heart and you know um, it is not easy it is not easy for Matthew to leave his work to leave his job because during that time if you're a tax collector and someone like Jesus Christ say go and follow me come and follow me follow me and he will say to his work, okay, I'm leaving. Matthew cannot go back to that work again because the next day, Rome is going to appoint or to have somebody in that place. It's again, it's happening. But Matthew, deep down in his heart, he must have hope for forgiveness. Let us all hope for forgiveness, my brothers and my sister. Matthew must have longed for what Jesus offered him. And he's offering the same like now, right now. That's why Matthew ran. He ran towards the Lord. You know, this type of conversion wherein you, have, you don't have to fight for your for the flesh you just have to 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 follow and leave everything leave all the garbage of the past and this is the way how Matthew in his full humility presented himself here writing this very chapter writing this very occasion in which he's talking about himself showing that all types of sin, whatever it is, my brother, sister, God can forgive you. You can always come back. Jesus picks that look of love in him, and he, was, he can able also to look at you with all of his love. He can search, my brother, the deepest part of your innermost being, the innermost, innermost part of our soul. He can search and, and, and match you in his response. He did not even okay, open his mouth. When he heard, follow me, he was up and gone. And that is conviction. Matthew lost a, a career. He lost his career, but he gained a destiny. He lost his, he lost material thing, but he gained a spiritual riches, a spiritual fortune. And Matthew understood it is from the Spirit of the Lord. He knew he had come, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save sinners. And he knew that he was the worst, just like the paralytic man. That is the understanding of the Jewish people. If you are sick, there's something, there's something, a, a sin. 
unforgivable. Matthew, the worst man in his town. And that's how far it goes in regards to forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. How deep his forgiveness can reach even the deepest part of our heart. But only God knows right now in your heart, my brothers and my sisters. His compassion is moving you right now into conviction. I pray that you will be, will be like Matthew. He left everything and followed the Lord. But I'm not saying, my brother, that you have to, to leave your work literally. No. Leave everything and learn and follow the Lord Jesus Christ from now on. And the Bible guarantees Yes, Matthew lost his career here, but he gained eternal destiny with God, with our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we need, all of us here. Matthew was moved by the compassion and it brought him into conversion and conviction. And I believe many of us here might be in the same situation with Matthew. You might be thinking that you are the most sinful person right now. Don't allow the enemy to do that. Don't allow anyone. Jesus Christ, he will call you and he will tell you. He's telling you right now, follow me. Follow him. We follow the Lord. And third point, Matthew is so overwhelmed with his decision. He's so overwhelmed with his action. That's why he throw out a party, a peace in verse 10. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was a party. It is a banquet. But look at the attendees. Okay, may RSBP pa yan, no? RSBP. And look at the attendees. The attendees are the most rotten people in the history of Capernaum. Because the only people Matthew knew were those people who work with with him in the same way those who are rotten those who are wretched those who are vile people because no one else would come near him only those with the same feathers they pluck together right they despise him and they, they, they despise all those sinners that's why Matthew had written here then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came. Hallelujah. Are you going to invite in one of your gathering, in one of your celebration, of your conversion, of your conviction, people who are sinners, who are avoided by, by the society? These are the sets of friends of uh, Matthew. Now, in, 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 in that compassion that he received, he wanted to celebrate and invited his sinner friend. Because no one would come to them. They despised them. So the only people he knew were people like himself. Who are the sinners as described by, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They were the prostitutes, the murderers, the robbers, the thieves, the irreligious, the godless and other tax collectors. Wow. Can you imagine that gathering? But Matthew doesn't mention, he doesn't tell us about the details of that banquet. Because Matthew, again, in his humility, he won't talk about that. But like so many believers, like you and me, all of us here, the first thought when we encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and we wanted to celebrate our conversion and our conviction, the very first thing that Matthew in his mind is to win his friend to Christ. That celebration is for celebration of his salvation and as well an invitation to his sinner friends. So as we read Matthew, Mark chapter 2 and Luke chapter 5, we will find that he caused this banquet in his own house. He opened his house for these people to come in. These sinners, these wretched people. And do you know who is the honored guest? He is the, who is the guest of honor here? It is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 
Matthew, he got the whole thing set up. He invites all the wretched, rotted, rotten, sinful people in Capernaum. All sinful person in Capernaum, you are invited. They are in one building. And Jesus Christ is the honored guest. Hallelujah. What a crowd, right? What a crowd. All the worst people. Can you get the picture? Can you get the picture of the reaction of the Jewish system, of their system of self-righteousness? They were all shocked. They cannot handle what Jesus Christ is doing. And then, then even they said, if this man is from God, why he's having dinner with this sinner not to us? Grab <laughs> it. And the answer is very, very simple. Why Jesus Christ did that? That is their question. Why? Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? Not with, with us. We are the righteous here. And the simple answer to that question is very easy. He came to save sinners. Now, in our case, if you are not willing to admit that, that he came to save sinners, then Jesus Christ has nothing to say to you. So here in verse 11, they stay outside. The Pharisees, they wait till the party is over. They wait till the, the, the banquet is over. And as the disciples coming out, they come out. They don't confront Jesus Christ. They did not. They cornered the disciples and they said, and when the parish saw it, they said unto the disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collector and sinner? Actually, this is an honest question. Why he is doing that? Could you please tell us, disciples? What kind of leader you got who, who hangs around with simple men? And Jesus Christ overheard in verse 12. He overheard the conversation. But when Jesus, okay, in verse 12, heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. In the statement, here in verse 12 and verse 13 jesus christ depend his disciples in following him they asked them why your leader and jesus christ overheard them and jesus christ depended his disciple and he has a very three uh very very uh, important argument here three argument that are so powerful the first one is the human reasoning first one is the logic human logic the second argument that jesus christ delivered here is all about the scripture the scripture that they are themselves the pharisees teaching and the third one is from his own divine authority now for the first argument okay jesus said it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who, who are sick. You know, in Greek, it is not those or need not. The Greek order, okay, it emphasizes here, need not. People, well, people don't need a physician, sick people do. And what Jesus Christ here, what he's doing is he, he is, uh, indicting the parties. So what he's saying, you are the one who are saying they are the sickest. Then by your own affirmation, they most need the position, right? They said, why your leader dining with the sinner? So therefore, these people, they are sick and they need someone a position 
So the analogy is very simple. When Jesus Christ said that, a physician can be expected to go among the sick people. And so the, it, it, the same goes to a forgiver. The one who can forgive sin should be expected to go among sinful people. The defense of Jesus Christ here is very simple. Jesus Christ, he went to the people who had the deepest need. In, this, in that banquet where all the sinners were gathered, he is the main guest of honor. In our time, our leaders, but they avoid. So Jesus Christ here is showing, he's saying to them, his, his indictment of their what? Of their self-righteousness. Jesus said, I did not come to invite people who are so self-satisfied like you, that are so convinced that they are good and they don't need help. And Jesus said, I rather come to invite people who are desperate and conscious of their sin and need for a savior. The scribes, the Pharisees, they are the worst and useless doctors, useless physicians. They were more concerned with their preservation of their own holiness rather than helping someone else. My brothers and my sisters, this should be our desire as well. The Lord said, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. In celebration of our salvation, let us look to those people with compassion. Those whom we know that they are trapped in the system of their sinful condition, of their sinfulness, like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that compassion might move them into conversion, conviction, and celebration as well. And invite others to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second argument of the Lord here in verse 13, but go and learn. Here, Jesus Christ, okay, with their own scriptures, go and learn. Why own scriptures? Because in the rabbi's teaching or writings, they are using always the word go and learn. Okay? Go and learn. And that is a, a statement being used in rabbinic writings. They are always using that. The rabbis use uh, those words as an exhortation. Okay? Exhortation to rebuke a person who did not really know what they should have known. Go and learn. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Go back to the books and come again. Go back to your scripture. And when you have gotten the information and learn what your own text says, this is what your scripture is teaching. And now you don't know it because Jesus Christ here, okay, he quoted again Prophet Hosea. In chapter 6, verse 6, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I desire compassion. Those who are hard looking for the mercy of God. So in other words, God said, I am not concerned with your religious activity, with your ritual. I am concerned with a merciful heart so jesus christ says it he, he said to them hosea 6 6 their own scripture in his argument it is not sacrifice that i want from you it is mercy you should have mercy on those people rather than condemning them in other words it is their hearts that Jesus Christ is after him. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
Same thing goes in the Beatitudes. So God is indicting the Pharisees. He's saying, you will never get the mercy of God because you show no mercy, which indicates that your hearts are not right. I hope we are learning here, my brothers and my sisters. The moment we look with someone who's committing sin, the same way the Pharisees look at them without mercy, we will never receive mercy from our God. There are people who think they can go through a rigid routine of being a Christian, going to church and do certain things and God will please towards them. No, he's never pleased with routine. That is separated from personal holiness. Without a change of heart, without a deep sense of sin, sacrifice, religious activities are dead. God hate those things. He said that in the, in, in Amos chapter 5, remember? I hate, I despise your peace days. I will not take delight in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and meal offerings, I won't accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offering of your fat beasts. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not hear the melody of your harps. But let justice run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Hallelujah. And finally, his third arg argument. He argued from the logic point of view, analogy, and thirdly, and in the Old Testament scriptures. And lastly, he argues from his own divine authority. Jesus said, I am not come to call the righteous but sinners for i did not come to call the righteous but sinners and jesus christ affirms what scriptures is saying these pharisees shown no mercy they're so self-righteous they were so blind to the word of their own prophet and they were so furious at a merciful position in front of them. The great position who reach out to those who have a deep knowledge of God's mercy. And Jesus Christ knows his target very well. And I pray all of us here are God seeking mercy. And the word called here, okay, the Lord said, I call the righteous. In Greek, it is kaleo, a, te a, a technical term, my brothers and sister, sister, about inviting. Inviting in, in Greek, it is in inviting a guest to a home, to a meal, or to a lodging. But Jesus Christ is inviting us right now. The kingdom of God. Is for the hungry and thirsty. The king, king, kingdom of God is filled with those people. The kingdom of God is for the hurting and the mourning. The kingdom of God is for the meek and the simple. That's what Jesus Christ is saying here. I call you. He's saying to you right now. He's calling you. And he said, to that party, to those people whose eyes is always looking at the sin of others, your self-righteousness causes you to refuse my invitation. So Jesus Christ inviting those who need him. Brothers and my sister, this is the theme of the gospel, that Jesus came to save sinners. And until you know you are a sinner. The Lord has nothing to offer you. In my conclusion, He saves 
sinners, and I am one. Matthew knew. He knew that he is a sinner. He don't look to the others. He look at to himself. And the moment he received that conversion, that conviction, and now celebration, he can invite his sinful friends. He know. He arose and followed Jesus. And the rest is a glorious history of this man. Matthew became a saint of God who penned this gospel and entered in a spiritual inheritance that goes on forever. Jesus receives sinners. Matthew could be the little mockers of Capernaum, the most wretched men in his town. Those are the, those are the kind of people the Lord can save. How far does Jesus' forgiveness reach? That's the message of this passage. He saves sinners. And I am one. I hope you know that you are one. Because if you do, you are within the range of His mercy. You are within the range of the great physician. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we bless your holy name once again. Thank you, Lord, for the life of Apostle Matthew in his humility, despite of his condition during that time, buying his way, Lord, just to gain something that, we, that makes him the most sinful man in his town. And yet, there you are, the great physician, standing and calling him, follow me. Father, I pray that we will hear the same voice right now. Call your children, call them Lord, and tell them to follow you. Father, I commit my brothers and my sisters unto you. They are your children. Everyone who is listening and watching right now, oh Lord, this is not an accident that we are all here. We have a different situation in life. We even have a physical sickness right now, Father. But beyond because physical sickness, you can do everything once again lord may we hear your voice telling follow me and i pray that all of us will stand up arose arise and follow you all this we ask in your merciful heart lord jesus christ amen amen and amen god bless you church maranatha Lord, come. Thank you.